Welcome to the new Europe studios on Place Jourdan. I am Dan Alexe. This is the place where you can eat, drink, relax and watch us make the news. With us today, Mr. Henri Malos, President Hello. of the mm. European Economic and Social Committee. Welcome. Perfect. Hello. Mr. Malos, this was one of the main pillars of the construction of the institutions of the European Community first and then the European Union. But for a very long time, it slipped out of public attention. What did you do to bring it back into attention, the Economic and Social Committee? Ah, you know, the first thing is to uh, be the voice of a civil society. And today, uh, in the 21st century, if you want to be listened, you have to speak loudly and frankly. So you pump and light uh, into it. Yes. And to say openly what uh, the citizens think. Uh, for example, big disappointment about the European Union policies of the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And uh, why we have, my predecessors thought that to be efficient, you had to be discreet and diplomatic. And I, I think can, today I in our time it's wrong. I cannot remember their names. <laughs> Yes, you but put, you put the wrong. face on this. That was wrong. This is why I want to be the face, the voice of the European civil society, which is sometimes happy, but sometimes unhappy. When it is an unhappy, we have to say that frankly, in the eyes, face to face, to our institution or to the member states, head of state and government. That's so why you I irritate a lot of people. Yes, but I'm visiting the member states. I was uh, 10 days ago in Spain, I met uh, the president of the government, uh, but I met uh, so people from the media, people from the sport, I met uh, Iker Casillas, uh, I met the minister of employment, I met young people, I uh, will go soon to Italy, I was two weeks ago, I met Silvio Berlusconi. This is the way to be heard. Why, why did you have to meet Berlusconi? Because he's a leader of uh, opposition. Plus, I couldn't resist, to be frank, I couldn't resist to meet him. It's so such a charming person. So this is how we do things. You put a face on your function. Yes, yes. Is yes. this your French side, your Corsican side? Because I think Corsican. it's mainly my Corsican side, because the French are normally a little too conventional, specifically the people from the north, the Parisian. But we are different. But you are still the first Frenchman to occupy such a high position after Jacques Delors in uh, the institutions. I'm in today the, the unique Frenchman to in such a high be position. a president of European institution. And, uh, this is recognized everywhere, except in Paris. Uh, people adore me in Corsica. I'm one of the local heroes. I was quoted as like a Corsican of the year 2013 after my election. In all the countries I visited, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, uh, Slovakia, Spain, Italy, they recognize me. But not the, in Paris. The, the committee. But Paris is still very conventional, yeah. too conventional. But you we have to change it. I see you know how to make friends. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you've been to Tibet recently. I've been to Dharamsala. I've Dharam been Sala. to India, Dharamsala. You know, this place where the, 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 where the Dalai Lama, Lama today is uh, for the last... Uh, he escaped, uh, he fled uh, from... Uh, Tibet in 59, so yes. he has been there for a long time. So it is the seat of the Tibetan government in exile? Yes. India offered them this opportunity yes. to have yes. a seat. And exactly. Didn't this gesture irritate China? This was not this the reason. This of yours, not of India. You know, this was my... I always try to keep my words. This is another thing, speciality, specificity of the Corsicans. Uh, three years ago I went there because we were invited by the Chinese to visit Tibet. And we say, okay, but we will go to see the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala too. And I was in the delegation, I met the, da the Dalai Lama three years ago. And he told me, Henry, if you are becoming the president of uh, EC, I want you to be the first president of your institution to come for the 10th of March or commemoration of the Tibetan uprising when I had to leave uh, Tibet. And I say, yes, I will come. So I came. This is the reason why I met him, not just to irritate the Chinese. I still have contact with the Chinese. I'm a uh, friend of uh, all the people. I'm not the enemy of the Chinese people. But we want dialogue and want a solution sure. for Tibet. Will you invite him over here? Yes. You did? Uh, I invite him. He will come probably next year. And for the next, uh, in July, the Sikyang, which is sort of prime minister of the yes. Tibetan government in exile, will come and I will invite him to a plenary session. Uh, I'm not sure that the Chinese will, uh, will the, Chinese, the Chinese government will like it, 
but anyway, I think it's important to do that. So what's your conclusion? You visited both sites. What's the real situation of human rights in Tibet? The situation is very bad. As you know, we have a case of uh, torture in prisons. Uh, I, had, I heard today a new case, a person died in prison after, after being tortured. We have a self-immolation who are going on. We are now the uh, number is 133, mainly young people uh, who dedicate their life to the, I would say, freedom. The Dalai Lama and the Tibetan central administration in exile, they don't seek for separatism as uh, the Chinese uh, leadership is lying. They just want what we say, what they call the middle way, that means uh, autonomy for cultural, uh, language, uh, education, environmental matters. And uh, the, the Dalai Lama told me, if you met the Chinese president, told him that economy defense, we can leave that to the Chinese, but we want to keep our identity. And the Chinese today, it, this is, it's a sort of cultural genocide today, because they kill the language, they kill the identity, plus there is a migrant, uh, million of uh, Chinese who migrate to Tibet, and so the Tibetans will lose all their identities, or just stay there as an attraction for the tourists, which is very sad. Did you meet the Chinese president? No. no, you haven't. Uh, the ambassador uh, invited me to meet him in Bruges when he made his speech. But after my visit to Dharamsala, I didn't get the invitation. I wonder why. Do you see any solution? Yes, I think you I have think hope. That. We have to hope. Uh, when I left uh, Dharamsala, when I left the Dalai Lama, he took me by the arm and he said, please send the message to the Chinese leadership that I'm ready to talk to them. I accept all their conditions, I accept to negotiate myself, I'm ready to meet myself, the Chinese president. Uh, I accept that we, we, we are not separatists, we just seek for autonomy, we don't want a big Tibet, we are open to discuss that, but please open dialogue, because when you see this self-immolation almost every day, these people are out of hope, disappearance. Yes. Henri Malos, president of the European Economic and Social Committee. You've been, in order to go to Dharamsala, you've been to India. Yes. India just stopped negotiating the free trade agreement. Why? Because it was blocked by the Ingo Indian Congress, the Parliament. What happened? Why? For good reasons. For good reasons. Which are? Because uh, I think that uh, uh, some of the elements of this uh, free trade uh, agreement uh, are a threat for a large part of uh, Indian population. For example, just give you a very short example. Uh, this free trade agreement will bring the big retail, European retail sector, I don't know, Carrefour, uh, Aldi, uh, Tesco and others, open for them the doors of the Indian market, which is today closed by millions of small intermediaries, small shopkeepers, which will be crushed, crushed by and, and this will di they will disappear. And this is the main political reason why part of the uh, Indian Congress of uh, uh, MP block this agreement. Because I think that this free trade agreement was prepared by the European Commission too much uh, under I think, the, the pressure of some big company, for example in retail sector and in some others, and we have to think on social impact on both sides, on European side for SMEs, a lot of sectors, and on Indian side concerning a lot of inter intermediaries, because you have millions, something like 300 million of people in India who live from this small business, intermediaries, and you cannot say, when I visited the European Union delegation, I, I met the head of the delegation there, and he told me, Yes, but uh, we have to modernize all this uh, distribution system in, in India. But I told him, yes, we understand, but it takes time. And this will have very severe social, social consequence, and we have to take care of it. That was the reason why. Does the European Union apply, the Commission actually, apply different rules when it is negotiating with the United States for a similar treaty? different from those applied to India? But yes. we have the, the treaty with, Amer with the United States being negotiated right now. I think uh, one uh, big uh, criticism I would like to raise is that uh, these negotiations are not transparent. 
We were not transparent at all with, uh, with India on both sides. That means no information on all the sectors, not just for a few elite privileged uh, big companies who have their lobbies here in Brussels. Were they more transparent when negotiating with India? The rules? Were no. More? no, no, and not same transparent secrecy. in India too. Same not secrecy. Same thing. Why? Not transparent in, in India too. And I think this is the reason of uh, I something that I don't understand. For example, as president of uh, civil society institution of the EU, I've asked several times to Commissioner De Goot to open the door of his uh, con meetings, conference meetings room, to have a debate with us. And there is always this uh, idea that trade negotiations are to be kept secret. But this is very wrong, bec because if it was theoretical, the idea is good, because you have to avoid any interference. But in reality, you can see that some big lobby are interfering. Uh, uh, on a daily basis, so at the end of the day, it's the SMEs of the population who are out of the negotiation, and some, very few, the happy few, are in. And this is totally wrong. So, w where are the rules of free trade in this? Where is the free market? There is no free market without acceptance and dialogue with the population. And I think this free trade agreement should not be seen as just a way to please some, uh, some big concern and some, some big sectors is going wrong and has very bad uh, consequences and repercussions in the, in the population. That means populism, extreme right, extreme left in the European Union, the same thing in, this, uh, in the other countries. Would you say that this is the result of the climate of uh, neoliberalism introduced during the Barroso era? I think uh, before yes. that, under Jacques Delors and the successive presidents of the Commission, one had the impression that it was more socially oriented. I and now uh, all you hear is money, free market, but not the population. Uh, I just, I can just uh, say that it's a compatriot. But I remember very well when Pascal Lamy was Commissioner for Trade. He came to the European Economic and Social Committee. He asked us to make an exploratory opinion on the human and social rights in trade. Uh, and uh, Mr. De Good didn't come to us, he even didn't come to, the, to our committee, and he, I think he has uh, not big respect for us. So yeah. we are, on this part of the Barroso uh, mandate, uh, very disappointed. Do you think the negotiations will be more transparent after the elections? Maybe it's just a strategy for not showing in what direction they go. We really hope to have, uh, to have transparency now. I really hope to have a big change in the way the European Commission and the European in institution as a whole will be, will be managed. This is the sense of uh, all the efforts I make to create visibility for the civil society. Because if we have a uh, low turnout, low participation in the election, uh, we have the uh, extreme right, the populism growing in the European Parliament, we cannot continue to manage the European institution as we did, because next time it will be worse and worse and worse and worse if we continue like that. We have to have a change, and the change is, in the uh, short term, first of all, to have a commission independent from the government, from the member states, that was in the Jacques Delors time. Secondly, to have uh, the commission close to the civil society, working with our committee, with our other uh, institutions, trade union employees, and so on, but it's not the case today. And third, to have a commission with a vision, a vision for a uh, more integrated Europe. And uh, with these three conditions, I think we could have, uh, again, new hope for Europe. Okay. As a final topic, let's talk a little bit about Ukraine. You are very much involved in Ukraine yes. and everything surrounding it. Yeah. You've met the singer Ruslana, you are meeting yeah. two of the Pussy Girls today. Yeah. And meanwhile, Crimea has been invaded. Do you think it's forever? Do you think it's lost for Ukraine? Can the West, can Europe do anything about it? First of all, I will not uh, take the fingers uh, lost or win. I think we have to, we work in a, uh, we are in a, in a world of interdependence. Uh, and uh, I've been in Crimea, I know what is Crimea. Crimea is Russian speaking. In Crimea we have the Tatars, we have a, it's a very complex situation. It looks like Russia has made a sort of annexion of, of Crimea. But uh, the people of Crimea, what is my concern is the people of Crimea. Uh, let's see what happens in some years. 
today a majority of them seem to be quite happy because the Russian will come with a lot of money, bring on the table, what the Ukrainian didn't do in the last 20 years. We should save the troop. But uh, um, I just hope that the Russian society will develop uh, in democracy, in terms in term, in term of democracy, in terms in term of, of rule of law. And our challenge now is to support the democratic reform in Ukraine because there is a need of a lot of democratic reform in economy uh, we have to get rid of the uh, uh, power of, the, of oligarchs to have more democracy, more social cohesion uh, and more freedom of speech and you will see that in 5, 10, 15 years if the situation is improving in Ukraine in terms of uh, more democracy, more European values and if Crimea stay under the the Russian, I would say, authoritarian regime, that the people from Crimea themselves will start to rethink their decision. And this will be the way that maybe uh, this annexion will not be forever. But just this way, I don't think we are in terms to start a war. It's not the question of that. It's a question of supporting now, this should be for me the priority, the necessity of keep the integrity of the, of the territory of Ukraine. We'll never accept this annexion, but we'll wait, take the time and make all efforts to support democratic reform in Ukraine and after that it may change, but I hope that it may change in Russia too. And then it will be much easier. So you because are one Putin is not forever. You are one of the important politicians who tell us that we don't have here a fight between good and bad. Ukraine itself is not one of the most democratic countries in the world. No, of course, and you know that there are some extremists uh, in Ukraine, yes. Uh, even one was killed by the, by the Ukrainian uh, police, and I think it was, uh, I don't say it's rightly, but I think it, uh, there are some extremists. There is a, it's a big mess today in Ukraine, so we have to support the, the, the government, which is legitimate, I don't accept the, the critic from Moscow, uh, support all the democratic reform, but in the same time to launch dialogue with the Russian civil society. This is why I will meet today in the, today in the European Parliament the Pussy Riots, uh, we will meet uh, the president of the memorial uh, NGOs with uh, one of the more, I would say, uh, opposition in Russia. Yeah. You saw that there was in the street of Moscow two weeks ago yeah. 100,000 of people who demonstrate against the annex annexion of Crimea. So I think there is some uh, sign of hope because the Russian people are lovely people. Uh, they are really truly European. What we don't like is, the, is, is their leadership, but we have to convince them that they should make some evolution in their leadership. But uh, this is the way. But concerning Ukraine, I am in favor of dialogue. I'm in favor of dialogue between Ukraine and Russia. Can you imagine closing the border? There are three million Ukrainians who work in Russia. What, uh, what will they do if, uh, if the borders are closed? Yeah. Thank you, Henri Malos. We had with us today Henri Malos, president of the European Social and Economic Committee. I am Dan Alexe in the New Europe Studios on Place Jourdan, the place where you can eat, drink, relax and watch us make the news. And a beautiful place. Come and visit here. Merci. Très bonne nourriture. Thank you. Good food. Good.